Good day to all the YouTube listeners that might listen to this message. This is Brother Joe. Uh, I identify myself as being a former message fo follower for over 40 years in a congregation at Cape Girardeau, Missouri. I'm no longer a follower of the message of William Branham, but I feel like I'm well qualified to speak on anything that concerns William Branham and his teaching. Uh, I didn't know the man personally, but I do know what he taught. And I, I'll state I believe my qualifications will match anyone, any war, as far as knowing what William Bradham said. Now, for 45 years, I listened to what he said, and I didn't realize that many things he taught was anti-Scripture, which I believe anti-Scripture, you're anti-Christ. Uh, now you say, well, Brother Joe, what's changed? Well, what has changed is this, I repented. And when I say I repented, this is what I mean. I realized I was an error, and I asked God to forgive me for 45 years of, nearly 45 years, not quite, of teaching many things in error. And the, Jesus said this, repent and believe the gospel. Now, when error is showed to you plainly, you either repent or you walk away from it, and if you don't repent somewhere down the road, I don't know how long uh, God gives Jezebel a space to repent, and I don't know how long that space is. I know God gave me a space to repent, and I'm very thankful for it. And when a person repents, they can believe the gospel, because that's what Jesus said. Repent and believe the gospel. If a person's an error, whether he's a Catholic, a Catholic, a Pentecost, a Baptist, a Methodist, Presbyterian, a Message, Preacher, when, when they show they're wrong, they're given a chance to repent. If they repent, then God will open their eyes to what Scripture says. And that's what I did. I repented and asked God to forgive me. And now I look at the message. Um, it's just a saying, you know, looking through glasses. I heard Church of Christ talking about looking through different pairs of glasses at Scripture. Uh, but I don't have a different pair of glasses I just look at the message through the Scripture, and that's what I would ask anyone to do. I call this a message for ministers of the message, part two. Now, I don't know. I've already preached part one. Some of you have listened to it. I don't know if a minister that's still in the message will ever listen to this or not. I have no way of knowing. I'm hoping some will. And I'll put some challenges out here. Uh that I, I'd like for them to face. Uh, now, no one, if they listen to this today, will be able to say, I didn't say the truth. Now, the truth is a scripture. They may not agree with uh, some man's interpretation of scripture, but you will not look at me and send me a message and say, you're not teaching the truth. Because it may not be the truth you lack, but it will be the scripture. And I may mention some ministers that I've tried to contact to or I've heard contact, and I'd like to question them about some things. But <clears throat> a lot of these ministers were my brothers. They have bought me dinner. I bought them dinner. We've sat together, hugged one another, prayed for one another, preached for one another, many of them. And others that I never preached for, still they know me. So I'm, I'm going to share what I feel like the Lord's given me. And uh, our, our little website that we stream our Sunday services on says, Brother Joe, I didn't ask him, but on there they did, a man that only uses scriptures. And that's, that's what I intend to do, just use scriptures. And if you can point to scriptures and take something that someone said and show that it's really not scriptures, then that should be correct in error. Uh, some people you can't do that. I have a, a, a friend who I love very, very much, and I don't even, as long as I've been in the message, he has two with me. Of course, he's still in the message now, and I'm not, so we don't have a lot of fellowship, although we will talk occasionally. But when I try to show him something wrong that's been said wrong, that's against Scripture, his answer is always, well, I don't know if he meant that or not. Or he will say, I'm not sure what he meant, so I can't answer that. 
Well, to me, it's easy to get by by saying I don't know what he meant by that or I'm not sure uh, what he's trying to say. There's a lot of reasoning. I know a lot of people on the prophecies. I won't get into that too much today. They uh, like the bridge prophecies. They'll say, well, William Brown saw a, a vision. That was some other river. That wasn't there. Or another good thing, they'll say, well, he's seen the vision, but he interpreted it wrong. And that's really kind of silly to come up with something like that. The Bible gives us a way that we're supposed to, well, it actually tells us to prove all things. And uh, when I start talking about Scripture, then I should be able to prove it, and you should be able to prove me wrong by Scripture if I'm wrong. Because you know the Scripture says, prove all things. Uh, many people don't do that. And if they would, we, we'd all be in good shape there. Uh, many people in the message uh, have gone back, that left the message, have gone back in the world when they found out it was wrong. And some have just become <clears throat> some kind of a denominational churchgoer. Uh, and what people do, that's, that's up to them. A lot of things out there on the internet about William Branham. And I, uh, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to move the clock close where I can kind of watch it here. I don't want to hold you too long. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of things on the web, and I'm not going to say which ones, there's a lot out there that I disagree with a lot of things they're trying to say. They're making emphasis that William Brennan may have done this or he might have done that. Well, if you can't find his own voice saying it, or at least two or three witnesses with him, then uh, I, I don't pay attention to that. Do I believe William Branham seen an angel? I, I don't doubt it. Uh, I don't know where that angel was from. Uh, if I take what he said the angel said, uh, makes me wonder. But I'll leave that be as it will. You've heard the other one. Uh, do I believe he had a supernatural ministry? Yes. I believe that he could tell a person's name. I believe he could tell where they lived. I believe he could tell diseases. I don't believe all that was faked. Uh, there's many things he said about it that I don't agree with, William Brown. Uh, searching for Vindication is one website out there that I think everybody ought to look at because I don't know much on it I disagree with. They they just put the facts out there. And I think it's kind of interesting. You can read deeds. You can uh, read newspaper articles. Uh, you can find out all kinds of things. But let's just go on now. I read two scriptures beginning. It was Matthew 15, 8, 9, and Mark 7, 13. I'm not going to read them again. Uh, but they, they talked about this, worshiping in vain and making the word of none effect through your traditions. And I'm, I accuse the ministers of this message of doing those two things. Now, I know that the people in the message, I've seen them cry, I've seen them raise their hands, I've, I've seen them run to altars and pray, I've seen them feel great things, emotions in those services, and I, I know that's there. And it's also in a lot of other churches. I started out, I, well, I started out in the Baptist when we went to Pentecost. Pentecost has all kinds of emotions. Uh, a lot of signs and things. And then I was under a couple ministers in the message, and one minister, well, two of them really, uh, turned out to be adulterers, uh, fornicators, not born again. But even in those ministers, ministries, I seen supernatural things. Uh, they didn't make them right because they weren't right. Uh, the very building we got in Cape, a minister that's later caught with a prostitute over in the Philippines when he's supposed to be in a missionary work, uh, and I don't know what he's ever repented of that, uh, prophesied that an old minister would be retiring from the minister and give me a chance to get his building. And I could go tell you several supernatural things that happened exactly like he said it would. And I can tell you a couple of incidents in, in his life where he prophesied, told people things that was correct, but he himself was a fornicator. And let's, well, he's never denied it. He just got caught. Uh, but let's leave that word is. Uh, signs happen to anyone. Uh, Ephesus prophesied correctly and then had Jesus uh, at trial and same to Pilate to be crucified. So a gift doesn't mean anything. 
I've heard people call Balaam a false prophet, but I don't think you'll find that in the Scripture. Uh, Balaam sold out for uh, rewards, as the Bible tells the spirit of Balaam, but he didn't prophesy falsely as far as I know. He told some things to do to get Israel off, and they done it and got off. Uh, but some of these prophecies were absolutely true. But it, let's, let's go on a little bit more. I want to take something that uh, I'd like for message preachers or message followers, or if you can get this to a message follower, see if he can answer this. A lot of them don't understand Scripture, so they don't tell them what you'll come up with. I know that. Or they'll just say things, or... Uh, you might give them a quote of William Branham, and they'll give you a quote of another th way of William Branham. And William Branham did preach opposites. What I mean by opposites, he preached one thing one way, then he preached it another way. So it's kind of hard to pin things down sometimes, but these things can be pinned down by Scripture that I'm going to talk about. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about, we know the message taught against Catholicism, and I certainly don't agree with Catholicism. Uh, at all. I believe it is wrong. But uh, you preach against Catholics, and one thing that they teach, and I've heard taught, perhaps you have too, that they they constantly crucify in Christ when they take, we call it the Lord's Supper, I think they call it the Eucharist, something like that. Uh, they believe it's the actual body and blood of Christ, that it's turned into that by the priest, so if it's the actual body and blood of Christ, uh, <clears throat> Then uh, and Catholics do teach that, and they believe that it's showing Christ literally crucified every time they do one of those. Well, let's take a quote of William Branham, if I can find it here. Now, I'm, I've not got any help here. I don't have anybody to switch the camera or change the computer for me. I have to do it all, so you'll have to bear with me. And uh, I don't know why, but some of these quotes got a buzz in them. Not a bad one, just a quick one, but... I want you to show you something uh, that William Branham said, and then I'm going to ask you if you believe that uh, for a preacher. I, I'd like for a preacher to answer these questions that believes the message. I, I, you know, I can't find them. They're, they're all, a lot of them are hypocrites. They'll look at it and then walk off or, or say we got to believe the prophet or some thing like the Catholics say you need to believe the Pope. I don't see any difference myself. I believe we got to believe Scripture. That's what I'm trying to say. So I'm going to Try to play William Branham here. I hope I can get it here as I turn around. And I want you to listen to it. And then I'm going to put the note up here and let you read what he says. I've got it highlighted right there on the top of the notes. You can see it, and let's see if we can hear it now. Here we go. Notice this now. Now, if there's no altar of sacrifice in heaven, where is the sacrifice for sin land? The land. Amen. There has to be a place where that slain lamb, bloody, is laying there. Or the blood is. Now. All right. And we're back to me now. You heard what he said there. He gets that from the seal. Uh, Jesus represented, coming forth with seven horns, seven eyes, uh, bloody. And, of course, he started the doctrine of uh, intercession. Being a mediator was over because the lamb was getting off the altar. But now let me ask you, did you know this? There's not one scripture in the Bible to tell you that there's a bloody altar in heaven with a body laying on it. We think the Catholics are bad. What about Jesus' bloody body laying up there in heaven somewhere to atone for our sins. Uh, I could give you a lot of scripture. I got Mark 16. When the Lord has spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and set on the right hand of God. Uh, Hebrews 10 said, After this man had offered one sacrifice for sins forever. He don't have to lay on an altar as a mediator or for sins that we commit if we commit any. He's a mediator. But sin was taken care of at Calvary. If you believe his body is laying on an altar, I'll agree with you if you believe it's Calvary. Because that's where it's at. 
at Calvary in St. John, I don't have the scripture written down, but he said it's finished. And it was finished. That finished the sin question. He rose from the dead the third day. And then after that, he went to heaven. See? Hebrews 10, 17, 18 says this, And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Calvary took care of it. See? <clears throat> and now in verse 18, it says, For remission of these is, where you're forgiven, there's no more offering for sin. So why does that body have to lay on an altar as an offering, as a mediator for our sins? What we'd have to believe that it was not taken care of at Calvary. And that's scary. Because I believe my sins was nailed on the cross with Jesus Christ and He took my place on Calvary. And yes, He's a mediator. But any time the devil has something to say, my sins were nailed upon the cross at Calvary. And I stand as Him as my atonement. See? <clears throat> and he, the Bible says He's alive forevermore. He's not... I don't know if we think, well, the spirits are running around doing this and that, but the body's laying up there. It's your imagination if you believe that, see? 1 Peter 3.22, he said he's going to heaven and set on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject to him. He's sitting on the right hand of God. We're not going to talk about the Godhead right now. Maybe in a future time I'd like to because there's sure a lot of confusion on it. And I believe it like I've always believed it. I've got more understanding. But I hadn't changed. But people feel to understand the altar was Calvary and sin was finished right there. To believe he lives on some altar, then you, you identify more with Catholics than anything. It, that's just a tradition of man. Now you might find a quote for William Branham saying he's sitting on the right hand of God, but here he makes it plain in what he says is a visitation from an angel on the seals. He claimed one place as he was revealing these seals that he called it the pillar of fire. That light stood right above him there. And he's saying that Jesus' body lays on the altar uh, as a mediator and it, that Somehow he's getting off of that, not a mediator anymore, and that's kind of strange anyway. But anyway, Romans 6 says, knowing that Christ been raised from the dead. Now his body raised from the dead, not just his spirit. Jehovah Witness don't believe his uh, body raised from the dead. And Brother Fulcher down in, uh, oh, where is it? Carolina maybe. I might have a, it's been a long time. I've actually preached for him. I don't even know if he's still alive or not, but he taught that Jesus' body didn't raise from the dead. Uh, but people look for reasons not to believe the Scripture. But the Bible said he raised from the dead and he dies no more. Death has no more dominion over him. So why would a dead body be in heaven if death has no dominion over him? He doesn't. He's sitting on the right hand of God. So who do you believe, preacher, message follower, if you're listening, if somebody got you to listen? Answer that scripturally. Or answer it like my friend down in Tennessee does things. Well, I don't know what he meant by that. I'm, I can't. And you go on under a delusion. Do you know the Bible said after you admonition, I think it calls it, after the second time, you're not to do it anymore? So I try my best twice to talk to my friends, my brothers that had been brothers, at least twice. But after that, they don't listen. I don't do it anymore. I commit it to God and pray somehow the eyes will be open. Let's look at something else, if you will. Excuse me while I turn here, and I want to emphasize something. Put the notes here, but let me see if I can find it on my little notes here. Uh, <clears throat> I've, I've been questioned about this next quote uh, by one of their sisters that has questions. But let me pray, play what he said, and he actually said it here, and I'll... Put the notes over there, and I'll play it for you, Lord willing. Just give me a minute to find it. And here we go. Because she was passed over in that time, she has also been given a sacred charge from God for redemption. She's got characters that she must not defile. If she would mire them, she's defiled for lifetime. No matter how much she's forgiven, she's 
she can't be justified. I'll strike that in a little bit. Got a scripture on that in a few minutes. She can be forgiven for her defilement, but she cannot be justified in this life. It's always with her. Notice. Now, she's been given this. She may be forgiven, but not justified. All right. He did say he has a scripture on this after a while, but I've listened to that message probably 30 times, and I've never found that scripture. I've listened to it a lot. I don't know how many. Probably that many at least, as most messages I've heard several times that he preached that they have access to. And I do have the whole library. I still have it. Uh, I don't have any tapes. I have it on my computer. I destroyed all of them and took the library at church and destroyed it. Uh, that's what he says. She can be defi she's defiled, and no matter how much she's forgiven, she can't be justified. Now, women like men sometimes make big mistakes. They do things wrong uh, before they come to God, and uh, sometimes after they come to God. And it's a shame, but it happens. And he does say they can be forgiven, but not justified. Now, justified means as if you hadn't done it. And every elect member of the bride is justified, I assure you. Now, you have a choice when you hear something like that. You can try to figure out what he really meant or say it's just a mummer of words. He didn't really mean that, but he said it. And I suppose at the day of judgment, it'll be played back. If, someone, if he or someone say he did say it, he did say it. So he said she can't be justified. Now that's a burden on a woman. I've met a woman like that. She just she just convinced she couldn't make it because that's what William Brem said. She could never be justified. She believes she could be forgiven and maybe somehow make it as a foolish virgin. That's another doctrine that can't be proven out by the Bible the way it's taught by William Brem. But <clears throat> and I tried to figure out ways to explain this, but the truth is it meant what it said, and here's what the scripture said. Now you have a choice. You believe that or you believe this. Acts thirteen, verse thirty nine. I'm not gonna put it up here on the board, but it's Acts thirteen, verse thirty nine. And here's what it says. And by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. So you have a choice. Do I believe the words that William Brown spoke? Or do I believe the words that was written in the Bible, the vindicated scriptures? They have been vindicated when they were written. They don't need any more vindication. They're true then, they're true now. Well, if you don't believe you can be justified from all things, you don't believe the scriptures. If you don't believe the scripture, to me, you're an unbeliever. Unless you repent. And I believe if you repent, you can believe the scriptures. Let's go on. Let's go on to something else, if I can find it here. Uh, I'll have to look for it, so please give me a moment here. <coughs> and I'm going to highlight it here so you can read it as uh, William Brown sa said it. And uh, he says it in another way, in other places, but this is one, this, this will do. This is what he says, so bear with me here. Yes, they help for the Word of God. They were Jews. They had their law. They stayed with it. Remember last night now? They stayed with that. And they were Jews that had the law, and the law was the word of God. They stayed right by. That's right. And for their testimony they held, they were martyred. And here were souls under the altar. After the church had been gone. All right. Uh, he also, of course, you read the scripture there yourself, you'll know they're given white robes, the souls under the altar. Now, he said those were Jews. And there's no question, uh, if you believe William Branham getting a revelation of seven angels that no evidence at all they ever appeared and caused the cloud out in Arizona, none, none at all. But he says that they were saved uh, because they kept the law 
and was sincere, and also on the Feast of Trumpets, he talks a lot about that too. Uh, they saved because he's blinded, he says, in other places, same message there, fifth seal. He says they, they was Jews. They kept the law and given white robe by grace. What, what does the Bible say about that? Do you believe that? Well, if you believe that, you're going to have to not believe the Bible. That's a serious, serious thing to believe that Jews are saved by keeping the law. It's so serious that <clears throat> here's what Paul said in the book of Galatians 2, verse 21. He said, I do not frustrate the grace of God. Now listen, listen, this is important. Preacher, message believer, follower, if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Now that, there's no question of what the Bible said. There's a lot of things about the law we could bring in here. You can't be saved by the law. No one can be justified by the law. He didn't say they're justified. No, but he says it's given grace. He said, that Paul said, I don't frustrate the grace of God. If righteousness come by the law, if these Jews, whoever they are, wherever they are, whoever you think they are, if they were Jews, which they weren't, but if you think they were, if they had made righteous by the law, they can't, then Christ died in vain. Do you believe Christ died in vain? I don't. And if you believe the Bible, you don't. So if you believe the Bible, how can you believe that's a direct revelation from God who sent an angel to tell it? I, he said the angels stood in the room. I don't know, but if those angels say these people are saved by law, when, when Paul wrote that if righteousness come to law, then Christ is dead in vain, that could not be. So I, I just don't see that, see. You see the danger of trying to follow a message and teachings in a message that contradict the Scripture makes the Word of God an effect. It's just like Paul, don't say that. It don't count. We don't, we don't want that. It makes the Word of God an effect. see? What are you doing? You're just say, well, you better lay that on the shelf. Well, no, you better find out whether you believe it or the Bible. You know, <clears throat> no different than saying the Catholics disagree with some things the Pope says, but they're still Catholic. We're told to come out. If you don't come out, you're guilty of the system you're with or the group you're with. If you're with a Pentecostal group and that Pentecostal group's in error and you don't come out of them, you'll answer with them. It don't matter how good a life you live and even if you disagree with them. As long as you're identified with something, see, <clears throat> you'll answer for that something. You know, the Catholics have said they're sorry many times for the many people they kill, but they're still Catholics. There's still people that follow it. There's people that disagree with the Pope, but they're still Catholics. So I don't, I don't know. Come out of her, my people, Revelation 18. So how can you condemn the Catholics or any denomination, say they don't believe the Word of God, when you yourself don't believe it? Oh, I could go on and on and on. But I, I don't know how I can make it any more plain than what it is. I... I'd like to get to one more thing. I'm not going to have time. Well, I could take time, I guess, go a little bit longer. We could do that uh, if we could. But see, when we talk about Babylon, Babylon didn't just start the Catholic Church. Babylon was a city. In the Old Testament, it was built to a city. It, it's, it's the uh, uh, place of every hateful bird, the hole of every foul spirit. And now... Besides Catholics, we got Muslims, we got uh, Buddha, we got all kinds of teachings out there, and uh, they all represent Babylon. And Catholicism, as far as Christianity, it is the start of a lot of things that's wrong in Christianity, and they picked it up themselves from some of the uh, teachings of pagans. Uh, I listened recently to a Church of Christ. They have oh, 100 videos, 1,000 videos, I think, over on their teaching. And I was listening to some of their teachings on history. As some of it's true about Pharaoh, uh, not Pharaoh, Caesars and different ones. When they reigned, what they did, and so on. Uh, but, of course, they don't believe in music. 
And uh, <clears throat> I wonder, well, why, why don't they? What do they say there? And uh, I listened to their video on it, and they don't believe in music, to make a long story short, because they said it's not in the New Testament. Now, we know in the Old Testament, David played the harp, and uh, Marion had a tambourine and song, but they just, they just put that away. That don't count as Old Testament. This is New Testament. Now, we don't have a piano. We don't have a guitar. And then they give an excuse because if you had a contractor to put in a new floor for you and you come home and he'd build a deck and put a ceiling in, uh, he could say, well, you didn't tell me not to. Well, the New Testament don't tell you not to use music with your singing. But I don't know, is it the Revelation of the 14th chapter? I might have a chapter off that, but it said harpers, that's singers, harping with their harps. That's voices singing with it. They have a musical instrument in heaven. But then I looked at their church, oh, six miles from here or so. Beautiful building in a little town. I live in Ozark, close to a river, kind of out in the wilderness, but there's a little town about six miles from me. They got a beautiful church of Christ church there, and I thought, well, they don't have any music, but they got a beautiful steeple on top of their church. Now, I wonder, now where did they get that? Did God not say to do that or to do it or they got no scripture for it and it is pagan the steeples on the top of every church you see come from pagan and represents the spirit of fornication without me going into many details uh Hyssops, two babylons a lot of things you could find it out on the internet if you want to but see false teaching puts a self-righteous in people I and the message, I just looked around, them poor people, they, nobody believes like me, I've got the truth out here. Well, I found out I had a lie. The Church of Christ, if there's people ever visit or see a church having music, they'll feel they're better than them because they don't have music, see? They think they're in the scriptures and other people are out and it's not even a good teaching. Well, don't mean to run the Church of Christ now and they got good people in them like every other church has. I'd like to get one more thing if I, if I could. Uh, well, we, we know the scriptures were, you know, there'll be great signs and wonders. And there's several things in there. <clears throat> you know, what prophet's going to show great signs and wonders and people are going to be deceived on it? I'm going to do one more and then I'll quit and maybe I'll come back for part three. I don't know. Uh, of course, this is kind of a long one here, so... But maybe I'll go ahead and play it. Uh, I'll try to highlight it. This is something that now tears me up to pieces. It bothers me terribly that people go for this. And I've tried to show people this. And they just absolutely turn and walk off. I'm going to see what you think about it. If you get a message preacher or listener or believer to listen to this, ask them what they do about this. It's not something William Branham said just one time where we wouldn't understand what he said. Uh, he said it several times. And I'm going to play two quotes, one after the other, if, you'll, if I can make this work. I want you to listen to what he said. One's on the third seal, you can read. The other's God of this evil age. And he said it ten more times, different places, about the same way, using different words, but teaching the same thing. So I want you to listen to it closely, and then preacher, listen to the scriptures and what they say. And I'll give you all the scriptures, but I probably won't take time to read them all. But let's just go to this and see if we can find it here and let you listen to it. Uh, here's the first one. Now that's the church, Christ, right. She fell, not in Eden, but in Rome. Amen. See? At the Nicaea Council, when she rejected that Pentecostal church Amen. that went down to Nicaea Amen. and listening to Romans reasoning, instead of holding on to the word, she fell and everything away from her died with her around her. Amen. All right, let's try the next one if I can find that one. And continue to read. It's sad, but she sure fell for it again. 
Christ's bride fell for it and took the intellectual knowledge of some seminary preacher instead of believing the pure, vindicated Word of God. Now, you hear the amens in there? Yes, that's right. So be it. Amen. Every one of those that said amen was saying that's exactly right. Well, what he said, God's bride. Now, he didn't say the church. He said the bride. Christ's bride. I'm looking at its side here. Fell at the Nicene Council. Christ's bride fell for the intellectual teaching knowledge of some seminary preacher instead of believing the pure word, vindicated word of God. I've taught on this before on the seven church ages that I put out there, but I'm letting you hear his voice. And I want, I want you to think about this. Jesus said this about his elect, and that would be his bride, Matthew 24, that these signs that these false prophets will show would deceive the elect if it were possible. If it were possible. Then he also says in uh, St. John the 10th chapter, verses 4 5, he says, He put his force, his own sheep, he goeth before them. Before they get to something, he's there. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger they will not follow, but flee from him, for they know not the voice of a stranger. That's Jesus Christ speaking, telling you that his sheep, his elect, his bride, will flee from the voice of a stranger. And here's a man telling you that they fell for intellectual knowledge of some seminary preacher. Which one do you believe? If you believe William Branham, you don't believe Jesus Christ. And I don't know how it could be any more plainer. Jesus told Peter, St. John 16, that I'll build my church on the rock and hell will not prevail against it. Yet William Brown said they died. They went down to the ground. Which one do you believe? Jesus said, St. John 10, 27 through 29, My sheep hear my voice. They follow me. I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which given me is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Well, how did Rome get them? See, message preachers are hiding this truth from their congregation. They're all headed to judgment to answer for listening to false teaching and being a false preacher. Like I was till I repented. I, it, this this is something that's really, really... There's no question. It's either Christ or William Branham. William Branham had to teach the bride fell in order to build him a ministry as Elijah to do restore a church that never fell. You say, well, according to history, look, history don't record the bride. They record the big movements out there. Sure, they got John Wesley. They got... Uh, Martin Luther, who taught opposites of one another. They didn't teach the same message. They taught opposite message. Luther taught faith, and uh, Wesley taught works. That's easily, if you study a little bit, you find them out. But like Elijah, thought he was all alone. And I know some of you people come out of the message, you feel like you're all alone. Well, God told Elijah one day, look, I have reserved 7,000. It wasn't written down. They didn't have a history of it. Elijah knew nothing about it, but God knows all about it. Let me tell you, there's some people today that believe the Word of God and will stick with it by themselves, and they're never by themselves because Christ is with them. Or with whoever they can find, they'll stand behind it, they'll support it with their faith, and they'll believe in it. Well, God bless you. I'm going to stop at this time. There's plenty more I could say about these times. Eighteen times William Branham repeated these statements. Eighteen times that the bride fell. Eighteen times he contradicted Jesus Christ, saying she can't fall. They can't be plucked out of my hand. It can't happen. And he comes around and says, Rome got them. Well, I don't believe it. No, sir. I don't know where they were at, but God does. And Malachi 4 tells us, he got a, I think it's Malachi 4, got a book written. It's Malachi, I'm sure. Written with those that feared God. They speak often one another. And I'm trying to speak to you today. And I'm trying to speak as often as I feel inspired. See, and it says God has a book of remembrance written, and he'll remember it when he makes up his jewels. So God's got the elect written down. Don't worry, they're out there. There may not be too many out there, but they're out there, I assure you. So God bless you. 
I might just add one other thing too. Uh, I know I'm going a little over here, but just let me say this. Hebrews 8, let me read Hebrews 8 to you. God made a new covenant. Most of you know that. We're under a new covenant. And <clears throat> he explains it like this. It's not according to the covenant I made with their fathers. Hebrews 8, verse 9, and also in Hebrews 10, if you'd like to read it. In the day I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt because they continued not in my covenant, and I regard, regarded them not, saith the Lord. That first covenant, they didn't continue. So he said, I'll make a new covenant, and this, and I'll put my laws of mine, write them in their hearts. I'll be their God, and they'll be to me a people. See, to believe the church fail or ever fail, or listen to someone besides the Word, you break the new covenant that God put in effect. He said it couldn't be broken. See? Uh, I, I hope you can see that. It's, it's really important that you understand that this, this church of God, that Jesus established still there. And let me put it this way. If the elect could be deceived and were deceived with Rome, what chance have we got holding to the truth? We could be deceived too. When Jesus said it's not possible to see the elect, he must not have really meant it if William Branham's telling the truth. I hope you can understand that. God bless you. Put your comments out there. Uh, and like I said, I, I, people still follow the message. They're blinded. I, they don't put scripture or what to believe out there. They just put something out derogatory that they know nothing about. Well, God bless you. God keep you. I'll bring out some more videos that the Lord leaves. And I do have a little bit more on this one, part three. So God bless you. As I turn my head to turn off this now, until we meet again somewhere or on the other side, God bless you. God keep you.